I'm Jeff Myers, president of Summit Ministries. We're based in Manitou Springs, Colorado, in a little town tucked right at the foot of Pikes Peak. And our mission is to equip and support rising generations to embrace God's truth and champion a biblical worldview. We have courses for Christian schools that are used all over the world, from the high school level, the Understanding the Time series, to the middle school level, to the elementary level, to help young adults, even starting as little children, understand how to think of the world from a biblical viewpoint. Manitou Springs, Colorado, if you've never seen it before, is a really cute little town. This picture, if in the springtime with a little bit of snow on the mountains makes it look a little bit like a train set, doesn't it? But if you were to come down to street level, very often you would see something like this. One travel reviewer described Manitou Springs in two words, hippie Mayberry. And in a place like this, people like to express their viewpoints and they may be countercultural to the ones that are out there in the world. Many times people in our town express their beliefs through bumper stickers. Now, when you take a look at a car that is covered with bumper stickers, some of them so covered with bumper stickers, you wonder whether there even is a car underneath the bumper stickers. You have to realize this is not a person inviting conversation. This is a person who has a settled opinion on something and posts that sticker as if to say, this is the way it is. If you disagree, just go away. Our entire culture has become hostage to bumper sticker thinking. And it is damaging our, the ability of our students and even of ourselves to think deeply about who God is and what he wants for the world. For my book, Unquestioned Answers, I coined a term, simplicism. At least I think I coined it. In the age of Google, you're never really sure whether you coined something. But by simplicism, I mean the conviction that something isn't really true unless it is easy to understand and summarize. And you know how these things come about. A pastor is giving a sermon, dealing with the theology of something. People are only paying half attention, perhaps. And then the pastor says, what it comes down to is this, and then gives you one beautiful sentence that summarizes everything. And people scramble to write that down. And then all of a sudden, it turns into a cliche. And what the pastor intended as an invitation to think deeper about something becomes the end of thought about that topic. I am so concerned about simplistic thinking among Christians that I wrote a book called Unquestioned Answers. The subtitle of the book is Rethinking 10 Christian Clichés to Restore Biblical Truth. I wanted to use these clichés that are common in our world, and many of them it's controversial that I used them, to help us rethink our understanding of God and of sin and of church and of the world and of a worldview. All of those kinds of things. So it's kind of a sneaky catechism. There are 10 different Christian cliches that I tackle in the book. And it's not a rant. I'm not trying to condemn anybody who believes these things. Many of these are things I personally have said at various points in time and am now rethinking. There are 10 of them in the book. But there are three I'd like to focus on in the time we have together right now. The first one is this, God said it, I believe it, that settles it for me. The second one is Christianity is about relationship, not religion. And the third, it's not my place to judge. Now, don't worry, you can leave a little bit of space in between each of these because we'll go into a little bit more depth. And I don't necessarily think we have to agree on all of this, but I'm hoping that it will be a really good discussion to help us think about how we can help our students go deeper in their faith and stay out of the shallows that seems to be so much of the culture in which we live today. So let's just dive right in. The first one is God said it, I believe it, that settles it for me. I first heard this one when I was a Young man, I was in a church service and the pastor said something that was quite controversial. Probably in a way to try to make his opinion seem that it was more valid. He said, if you don't believe it, don't take it up with me. Take it up with God. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it for me. 
that wasn't sufficient for me. I was sitting there thinking, but how do we know that that's what God actually said? I mean, you made a controversial point here, but how do we really know? And later, as I reflected and I realized, the problem is not that God said it. God clearly did speak. The problem is not that I believe it. I do. The problem is that last part when I say that settles it for me. In other words, I'm making the truth about God's word dependent on me, on my opinion, making myself the center of reality. And as soon as we begin doing that, we are on very dangerous ground when it comes to not only understanding God, but understanding everything else. So let's take a look a little bit deeper. The Bible is an amazing book, 66 books in fact, 40 different writers written over the course of 1,500 years in different languages, different cultures, people from kings all the way down to fishermen and tent makers. And all of this comes together to tell one story of the world from God's perspective of creation, of fall, and of redemption. There are two key words that theologians often use when they talk about the nature of scripture. One is they talk about scripture being inspired. This is based on a passage from 2 Timothy 3.16, where scripture says that all scripture is God breathed, breathed out by God, inspired. In other words, what the authors wrote is exactly what God intended to have had communicated. The second word often used is that scripture is inerrant. Uh, there are a lot of different positions on inerrancy, but what I don't mean by this is that there are no differences in the manuscripts as they were copied and recopied down through the centuries. It doesn't mean there were no errors in transmission. What it means is that when scripture is carefully interpreted, in the light of the culture in which it was written and the means of communication common at that time, then we will see that it is completely true in what it says about God and his creation. That's a mouthful, but that is essentially the idea that scripture is inerrant. That through scripture, God communicates not only what is true about all of the world, but what is true about his nature and character. And the power of scripture is unbelievable. When we see, we think of scripture, we have to realize that the Bible is one of those books that invites critical thought and inquiry. It's not saying, it's not like a bumper sticker saying, this is it, stop questioning. The Bible calls us to be deeply familiar with scripture. It calls us to interpret scripture accurately. It calls us to defend scripture. It calls us to answer arguments against it. And why is all this so important? Because the Bible is the most world-changing book in all of human history. It's the, it's the centerpiece to world literature. If you look back at the, the quotations from Shakespeare and say the Bartlett's book of quotations and the quotations from the Bible, you'll realize that much of the language that we have in common around the world to this day is shaped by the way the Bible describes things. Bible knowledge marks an educated person. Richard Dawkins, who you know to be one of the most vehement anti-Christian atheists in the world, said this, a native speaker of English who has never read a word of the King James Bible is verging on the barbarian. There's no way you can say that you're an educated person and not be familiar with scripture. Bible knowledge marks a moral person. The great moral commands in all of history, such as the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule, find their origins in the Bible. Even the famed British atheist Bertrand Russell, the philosopher and mathematician, said, what we really need in the world is Christian love and compassion. Bible knowledge has changed the nature of all of society. Even some of those passages that are really obscure that seem like they, they might be hard to apply. Here's an example. Exodus 21, 33 says, When a man opens a pit, or when a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restoration. He shall give money to its owner, and the dead beast shall be his. I don't know about you, but when I was first reading this passage, I had a little prayer journal. What did you learn from today's reading that you can apply to your life today? And I was thinking, I have no idea. Don't dig a pit. Don't move in next door to somebody who has an ox or a donkey. I am not sure how I would apply this. Well, it turns out 
This command right here in Exodus is the basis of a huge part of what we now call Western law. It's, it's the basis of what we call tort law or negligence law. That if you dig a pit and your neighbor's animal falls into it and the animal wasn't expecting there to be a pit where yesterday there was just a path out to the pasture, you have to make it right. Part of loving, loving your neighbor is anticipating, foreseeing things that would be likely to harm your neighbor and not doing those things. Isn't that incredible? But this is a huge part of our law today, and it can be traced back to these obscure passages in the Old Testament. It has even changed, the Bible has even changed how we see our own job as educators. I don't know if you've ever studied the mo the the way modern education got started, but it's a pretty bizarre story. It goes back to, I think back to this guy here, St. Columbanus. He lived in the 500s. He was an Irish monk. He got a hold somehow of the gospels. Somehow he found out that Jesus had said, go into all of the world and make disciples. So he said, well, I need to do this. He told his brother monks, I need to go into all of the world and make disciples. And they asked, well, what do you mean? Well, I don't know. There, I don't know what other world there is, but clearly there is something. So he made an animal skin boat, no oars, no sail. His brother monks just pushed him out. Goodbye. And off he went to evangelize the world. He landed in Great Britain and he set up a monastery there. The monastery turned into a library. The library turned into a university. Then he got back in his boat, floated away again, ended up in France, started a monastery, which turned into a library, which turned into a university. He did this then all across Switzerland and even into Italy and became one of the most famous people you have never heard of in the history of the church. These universities that had started out as monasteries included institutions that we know of today that are very prominent, including Oxford University. That one wasn't founded by Columbanus, but it was founded in a similar fashion as a monastery. One of the early professors at Oxford University was this guy, Robert Grossetus. It's a funny name because in German, it could be translated to mean fathead. So yes, there literally was a professor fathead. He taught something that we would think of today as science. He said, look, if, if the world is created, then it should have a design to it. We can make observations at time A and time B and know that we're talking about the same world. All of those sorts of things. He laid that groundwork down. You may have never heard of Robert Grossetus, but you've almost surely heard of one of his prized pupils at Oxford University, Roger Bacon. From Roger Bacon on, is what we consider to be the, the era of modern science. In fact, Rodney Stark from Baylor University said that of the 52 people who we can look back at as the founders of modern science, all but one of them, are, or only one of them was an atheist. One was maybe a new spiritualist. 50 of them were believing Christians, two thirds of whom, Rodney Stark says, would be today what you might call an evangelical Christian, someone teaching Sunday school and using every opportunity to disciple people to know Jesus better. The idea that science has to be completely naturalistic is a fallacy that so many of our students fall into when they get to the university. Isn't this interesting? The Bible has profoundly shaped all of these aspects of society. And we have not even begun on talking about human rights, the development of health care, the development of rights for women and children. All of those things came not from, uh, from Athens, not from Rome, but from the development of Christianity and the idea that every single person is valuable because we bear God's image. So it's not enough to say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it for me. We need to dig in and understand scripture more fully. Second is Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. I am certain somebody is going to be able to go back through an archive of the speeches I've given in my life and, and find that I have said this at some point in time because I grew up for many years in a, as a child in a very strict fundamentalist kind of church. I began to say, look, stop thinking about all of the rules that Christianity is a relationship with Jesus, not just about all of the rules. 
I've recently come to think, however, that this is not correct. Neither the word relationship nor the word religion fully encompasses everything that the Bible tells us about the good news of Jesus Christ. But we need to be able to go deeper. In the book, Unquestioned Answers, I tell what I think is one of the most profound stories I have ever heard. And it starts in a concentration camp called Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz-Birkenau is where the Nazis in Germany perfected the art of mass extermination. A million, perhaps two million people were killed in these camps. My son, many years ago, and I visited this camp. And right outside the gates is this sign, Arbeit macht frei, work sets you free. It's these bars of iron twisted into words that are so deeply cynical because no one until the end of the war was ever set free from Auschwitz-Birkenau except by death, usually by suffocation or horrible medical experiments or shooting or poisoning. One day, somebody escaped from Auschwitz-Birkenau. And the punishment for an escape is that 10 other people will be randomly chosen from the camp to be executed in the most grotesque possible way, the withholding of food and water until death. Somebody escaped, and as the commandant began to call out all of the different people, they, he, he, he called out a name of a man who stepped forward and said, my family, what am I going to do? And then all of a sudden, this man here, Maximilian Kolbe, a Polish priest stepped forward and said, I am a Polish priest. I would like to take this man's place. Maximilian Kolbe and several others were put into this cell and starved. He died an ignominious death. Who would ever even know that it happened? But a couple of years after the war, there was a Polish priest named Karol Wojtyła who heard of the death of Maximilian Kolbe and said, that man is going to be my hero. You may not have heard the name Karol Wojtyła, but you have heard of the name that Karol Wojtyła took upon becoming Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, John Paul II. John Paul came back to Poland to have a series of, of masses across the country. In one of those masses, more than a million people showed up. And he said, he didn't draw people's attention to the communist government. He didn't talk about politics and economics at all. Instead, he talked about Maximilian Kolbe and said, do not fear. And as people heard that message and took it to heart, they were able to gain the courage to resist their communist oppressors. And communism fell in Poland. It fell all across Europe. Ultimately, the Berlin Wall came down. Maximilian Kolbe wasn't just an anonymous prisoner in a prison camp. He was a man who took a stand for what was right and in the process of doing that, became the hero of someone who helped topple an, an evil empire. As I thought of that, I wondered if my faith, just thinking about relationship and not religion, had the intellectual resources necessary to really be strong enough for the kind of world in which we live in today. And then I realized according to the dictionary, that religion is a set of beliefs about the cause and nature and purpose of the universe. It's, that is the Bible. So Christianity gives us not only a savior in Jesus Christ, through Jesus it gives us a framework for understanding all of reality. At Summit Ministries, we teach students that there is such a thing as a Christian worldview. But we also line the Christian worldview up against five prominent counterfeit worldviews, Islam, secularism, Marxism, new spirituality, and postmodernism. And we show how the Christian worldview has reasonable, intelligent, powerful, persuasive answers to life's big questions in theology, philosophy, ethics, biology, psychology, sociology, law, politics, economics, and history. And in so doing, students realize, I'm not just a Christian because that's the way I was raised. This is true. And all of these other worldviews are counterfeits that don't have answers that can be consistently applied to every aspect of society. So we need to stop saying Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. In fact, it is a religion, a set of beliefs about the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe 
that is based on relationship with the creator and redeemer of all. And then the final point, the third one, the third unquestioned answer that I wanted to talk with you about in the time we have together is this one. It's not my place to judge. It's not my place to judge. I have been shocked, to tell you the truth. I mean, I knew our, our society was going in a direction that was not positive, but I was shocked to find how much this has affected church-going Christians. A couple of years ago, we did a major nationwide study with the Barner Research Group at Summit Ministries, and we found that 62% of church-going Christians under 45 years of age strongly agree or agree somewhat with the following statement. If your belief offends someone or hurts their feelings, it is wrong. In other words, there is no truth except what people personally feel should be true for them. And you've heard this. People say, well, this, I'm going to speak my truth or you need to speak your truth. But it brings up a question we should be talking about in Christian schools. What is truth? Is there actually a way we can know real things and will that really make a difference? Philosophers have told us that we can know things, but there are three aspects to it. First, in order to know something, we have to have a belief. We have to have an idea about reality. Second, that belief has to be true. It has to correspond to reality. And then third, the belief has to be justified. It has to be warranted based on the evidence. Obviously, there's some things we end up believing where we just sort of happen into it. We could be, we could just get lucky in thinking that something is true and find out later that it is. People forget the difference between their opinions and justified true belief. It is my opinion that chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla ice cream, but it is not an opinion. It is a justified true belief that Abraham Lincoln was shot on April 14, 1865 and died the next day. It is my opinion that medium rare steak is best, but it is a fact that Jesus Christ rose bodily from the dead. Now, a lot of people are saying, no, wait a second, you've gone too far there. But the evidence from Scripture and that has been collected since that time is overwhelming in that direction. We don't have to say that that's just an opinion. We don't, it is an opinion to say that every religion is true for those who believe it. But it is not an opinion to say that the Bible is a really good source of authority. I hope that makes some sense. We can know things. The question is, what does that look like when we interact with society? Because a lot of times we look at somebody and say, well, that person is judgmental and that they're kind of a bully. They're sort of mean. Jason Jimenez, one of our speakers at Summit Ministries, and has written a book called Challenging Conversations. In the book, he says that most people are avoiders of conflict. A few people kind of go all the way across the spectrum, though, and become aggressors. They demand that their opinion get to, is the one that is heard, you know, and they're always looking for that mic drop moment after which everybody else has to be silent because they're so thoroughly schooled. He said the goal as Christians is to be advocates, to be advocates for the truth of Scripture and, this is important, advocates for the people we are talking about things with. We don't have to just go between avoider and aggressor. We can be advocates. And this is exactly what scripture tells us in 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Rather, he should be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. It's important for our students to understand we are not in Christian education to escape from the world. We are in Christian education to learn how to engage it. At Summit Ministries, we use this word picture. We tell our staff members, that we see influence, the DNA of influence is two strands. One strand is truth, one strand is relationship. What is your job as a Christian educator? To put rungs in the ladder between truth and relationship for some student every single day of your career. Along this line, we believe that conversation is at the heart of it. When, when I learn that I'm, I'm visiting with someone with a very different worldview, my goal isn't to shut them down, Everybody else in society, it's politically correct to shut people down. I want to open up the conversation. So we're teaching our students to ask questions like this. Tell me more about that. I showed you this picture earlier, Manitou Springs, Colorado. 
If you were to look carefully in that picture, you would see in the distance, there's a little hotel right there. And if you were to look carefully at the top of that hotel, which is the home of Summit Ministries, you'd see a cross. And that cross fell over in a windstorm. And somebody came to the door and knocked on the door and said, your cross fell over, you need to get it back up there. And we knew this person was a Buddhist. So the staff member asked, so why is that cross so important for you? And the person said, dude, the whole vibe of our town is off if your cross is not on. On your school, there's a cross. And it should be the same for you and for me, that what comes out of that place is world-changing and powerful because our students know how to stand for truth and fight against evil and injustice and go deep and not stay on the shallow surface where everybody else is in our culture today.